The integument consists of two parts, a cutaneous membrane and then some accessory structures, which include things like hair, nails, glands, and so forth. Now, the cutaneous membrane is comprised of an epidermis, which is a stratified squamous epithelium, which overlies the dermis, which is our connective tissue layer of our cutaneous membrane. Below the cutaneous membrane, we have something called the hypodermis, also known as the subcutaneous, which is not part of the integument, but directly underlies it and connects it to deep structures within the body. Let's have a closer look. Now we're going to look at the integument. And the integument is simply a fancy word for your skin. And it consists of two major parts. It consists of what is called the cutaneous membrane, which is one of the membranes we studied in the previous chapter, and the accessory structures. And the accessory structures would be things like hair and fingernails and so forth. So now let's look at the cutaneous membrane. The cutaneous membrane is composed of two parts. We have an epidermis, and epi means upon, so the epidermis then would be upon the dermis. And while usually they're stuck together, I made a space between them just so that we can talk about each one of them individually and see that the, the cutaneous membrane is comprised both of the epidermis and the dermis. And the dermis is the underlying part and when we go back and talk about our membranes, we usually have an epithelial layer that is underlied by a connective tissue layer. And indeed, that's what we see. We see that the, the dermis, which is the part underlying the epidermis, the dermis is going to be a connective tissue layer, while as the epidermis is an epithelium. And the epidermis is a stratified squamous epithelium. And so I always tell people that on the test, you must know that the epidermis is stratified squamous epithelium. If you miss that question, I will take off double points. So the epidermis is a multi-layered stratified squamous epithelium. And the dermis is our connective tissue layer. And when we look at both of these things together, they make the cutaneous membrane. And then we can look at the each component individually. The epidermis here has several layers that we'll talk about in just a, a little bit. And the dermis has two main layers that we'll talk about. So let's start with the epidermis. That is our stratified squamous epithelium. And as we know, we name our epithelia for the type of cells found on the top. So our flattened cells are found here at the top. And if we go through our layers of cells, we will find that we have four layers of cells. Within the, the epidermis, and in some areas we actually have five layers, but in most areas of skin, which we call thin skin, which is most of the skin covering our body, we have four distinct cellular regions or cell layers within the epidermis, and then we have specialized areas of skin, thick skin, that are in the palms of our hands and the soles of our feet, because these skin areas are thicker because they're going to be coming into contact with things, you're walking on the ground, you're picking up things, sometimes hot things, so you need an extra layer of protection. But we will notice that there are some structural differences between thin and thick skin. One of the most obvious is that we have an extra layer of cell types within the thick skin. So let's start with the epidermis and let's start with the base layer here of cells. The base layer are called the stratum, and stratum means layer. Stratum germinativum, also the stratum basale, which you can think of as the germinative layer. These are the cells that are reproducing. And they look very cuboidal here because they have all the cellular machinery in order they can reproduce. So we have some germ or stem cells down here that are going to be dividing and pushing up so that one of these stem cells will stay in the stratum germinativum. And then the daughter cell, one of the daughter cells, will be pushed up into the next layer. And we'll talk about this layer in just a little bit. But suffice it to say that this is also known as the stratum basale, or the base layer, because it is the bottommost layer, or the inferior, deep, deepest layer of the epidermis. And it sits on what is called a basement membrane. And the basement membrane is this thing that I'm highlighting here. 
is a thing that is going to interface with the dermis below it. So the basement membrane is going to connect the epidermis with the dermis. So the stratum germinativum sits on this basement membrane, and these are going to be the dividing cells. And these cells, when they divide, some of those cells will be pushed up into this layer called the stratum granula, uh, sorry, the stratum spinosum. And it's called the stratum spinosum because what happens is these cells are starting to dehydrate a little bit. They're losing some of their cytoplasm and the cytoskeleton is beginning to stick out a little bit and it gives them a spiny appearance. Hence, we have the name stratum spinosum. At this part, point, they're going to start making something called keratin. And these are these fibrous proteins that are going to start to cross-link. But as these cells get pushed further up, they're going to get flatter, they're going to lose more of their cytoplasm, and they're going to then become the stratum granulosum, so-called because it has a grainy appearance or a granular appearance. And at this point, they're really producing a lot of keratin, and they're cross-linking these, these proteins, and they're getting this nice fibrous network that's going to give strength to these cells. And then, in thick skin only, we have a stratum lucidum, which just means a clear layer, and it's one row of cells thick. We find it only in thick skin, and then above that we have the stratum corneum, which is the horn layer. And at this point, the cells are dead. They are chock full of keratin, and they provide this tough outer layer that resists abrasion, helps hold in moisture so that you don't lose water through insensible perspiration, and also it provides a barrier against external things such as chemicals and abrasions and this kind of thing. And the stratum corneum, depending on what type of skin you're in, can be anywhere from 10 to 30 cell layers thick. So in thin skin, it's relatively you know, 10 to 15 cells maybe. In thick skin, it can be 30 layers thick. So, or 30 cells, I should say, thick of these, these keratinized cells that form this, what we call horn layer, layer or stratum corneum, and that's that tough outer layer of skin. And interestingly, these cells, all these cells are called keratinocytes because they produce keratin. And they really don't start producing keratin really until they start getting in the spiny and granular layers here. And then they really kick in the production of, of keratin here. And at this point, the keratin is becoming more and more cross-linked and it's becoming a tight, uh, tighter weave and a more robust weave. So by the time we get up here, we get this really nice hard layer of skin. And what's interesting about the skin is it's very supple and flexible. So the skin is held together by very tight interconnections between the cells. So if you go out and you get a sunburn, you notice that the top layer of cells will start to peel off. And they peel off as a sheet or a layer of cells because all of these cells in the entire epidermis actually are held together by very robust connections that we call desmosomes or spot desmosomes. And these are going to be a very specialized connection. They're really gonna help hold these cells together. Now, let's look below the epidermis at the dermis. And the dermis is our connective tissue layer that has two parts. We have this part right here called the papillary layer. And it's called the papillary layer because it has these dermal papillae. And papilla means mound. So these dermal papillae here are what are going to interface, if you will, with this wavy basement membrane of the epidermis. And the reason for this is we can increase the surface area of this connection, and that strengthens the connection. So we can have a much stronger connection than if these two layers were just sitting one on top of the other like this without any kind of interdigitation. So this interdigitation between the dermal papillae, which are these mounds, and the waviness of the basement membrane of the epidermis, we call the epidermal ridges because they form these ridges. And the ridges here follow the contours of the papillary layer. So the reason we call this the papillary layer, once again, is that we have these mounds called dermal papillae, and these are going to increase the surface area here, which provides a stronger attachment. This cell layer here, this dermal layer, 
is called, um, or I should say, has a realer connective tissue. So this has that loose framework of connective tissue that has different cell types. It's got some collagen fibers. It's got some elastic fibers in here, that very open framework. So our areolar connective tissue is here in our papillary layer. Below that, we have the reticular layer. And the reticular layer is characterized by dense irregular connective tissue. So it's a little bit stronger and it's going to give us this kind of cross-woven ability to resist tension and torsion in multiple directions so that when you do this and you pick your skin up, you can actually twist it without causing any damage because you've got all of these, these dense, irregularly woven, if you will, proteins, these, these fibrous proteins in here that are giving this strength. Now below the dermis, we have something called the hypodermis, which is mostly adipose. And adipose are, are specialized cells that store fat in the form of triglycerides. So we have this adipose layer beneath it. This is part of the subcutaneous or hypodermis. They're the same thing. They are not part of the actual integument, but this is the connective tissue that will connect the cutaneous membrane to the underlying structures. And it's mostly adipose tissue. We also see some elastic fibers and other things in here. But the border between the subcutaneous and the cutaneous membrane is not very sharp. We will find some important things about the border here as we have lots of blood vessels running through it. So we're going to have a plexus, if you will, of blood vessels that sort of run along the border here of the cutaneous membrane and the subcutaneous. And the subcutaneous, you've probably also heard of if somebody has a subcutaneous injection, they are getting an injection into this area here. And this also gives rise to hypodermic. So if you have a hypodermic needle, a hypodermic needle is used to give a subcutaneous injection. And the reason that uh, some drugs work well to be given in a subcutaneous injection is because we have some blood vessels in here. And the blood vessels, the red ones are arteries and the blue ones are veins, the blood vessels are what's going to supply this tissue. So we have this, this collection of blood vessels here that will send some other blood vessels up here so that we have a blood supply to the overlying tissues. So we're going to see some blood vessels in here. And I'm drawing these arteries and veins are very small at this point. They're becoming small arteries and venules. And these will give rise to capillaries. And these capillary beds, a lot of them we will see will be in these dermal papillae. And as you recall, epithelial tissues are what we call avascular. They have no blood supply. So the epidermis does not have its own blood supply. So the epidermis is entirely dependent upon the dermis and nutrients and oxygen being brought via the blood supply in the dermis and diffusion from the dermis into the epidermis. So nutrients, oxygen, they're all going to diffuse into the epidermis and any waste products and carbon dioxide are going to diffuse from the epidermis and be picked up by these capillaries. So this is the papillary plexus here. You'll see we have capillaries in these dermal papillae and these are what's going to be supplying our nutrients and oxygen to the overlying dermis. Epidermis, sorry, epidermis. So interestingly, what do we got here? We've got a whole bunch of really nice dividing cells in the stratum germinativum, and these are giving rise to the cells that are going to push up and become the upper layers of this, this epidermis, this stratified squamous epithelium here. But we notice as they push up, they get farther and farther away from the blood supply. So that by the time they reach the stratum corneum, the horn layer, they're dead. And one of the reasons for this is that they no longer have the access to the blood supply that these deeper cells have. So 
This is one reason why the stratum corneum is dead, but the other reason is simply it's a bunch of expendable cells. You can get scratched and you can have abrasions and these kinds of things and whisk away some of these upper layer of cells and there'll be some underlying cells to replace them. And this is one of our two properties of epithelial cells. Not only are they avascular, but they're very easy to regenerate. So they have stem cells on the base layers that regenerate very easily. So epithelial cells are regenerative tissues, but they do rely on an underlying connective tissue layer to provide for them the blood vessels, or I should say the nutrients from their blood vessels to be able to diffuse up out of the underlying tissues into the overlying epithelial tissues. So another feature that we have of the dermis is this is where most of our accessory structures are going to originate from. So we're going to have several types of accessory structures. We're going to have hair that's going to originate from the dermis. So we typically have a hair follicle in which we will find a hair and the hair follicle will project up through the epidermis. So the hair is one of those things that projects up through the skin and we have hair all over our bodies with the exception of the soles of our hands, the palms of our feet, there are some areas like external genitalia and lips that have no hair. And when we have hairless skin, we call this glabrous skin. And most hair on our body has, or sorry, most skin on our body has hair. So it is, well, it's hairy. So it has different types of hair. We've got vellus hair, which are the thin peach fuzz type of hairs that you find you know, on your arms, on your face. Some of you have more or thicker hairs on your arms. And then you can have what are called terminal hairs, which are the dark, thick hairs that you find, for example, on your head, your eyebrows, and your armpits, and so forth. So terminal hairs are the thick, dark, pigmented hairs, and the vellus hairs are kind of the peach fuzz that you might find on your cheeks. So at any rate, most of the skin on the body is covered with hairs with the exception of your glabrous skin, which is found on the external genitalia, the lips, the hands and the feet, the soles of the feet and the palms of the hand. Other structures we'll find in the dermis is we will find sensory structures. As we know, the skin is very sensitive, so you can feel hot things and cold things and soft things and vibrating things. So we have within these dermal papilla, we often have something called a Meisner's corpuscle. And this thing is a sensitive receptor and is one of our sensory receptors that is sensitive to touch. We even have some cells within the stratum basale that are specialized cells called tactile discs and they will interface with a type of neuron in the skin, in the dermis, and usually this would, this would be sitting one on top of the other. And this also provides sensation about touch, very light touch, and is very sensitive so that you can feel textures and shapes and this kind of thing. We also have some deeper receptors that help us feel vibration and pressure, and we find these in the dermis as well, in that deep dermis. And so here's another type of neural tissue. And I'm just bringing these up because the skin, the cutaneous membrane, is rich with these sensory receptors that have neural connections that bring information from the receptors to the central nervous system for processing so that we know when we have what we have touched. So we can tell a smooth surface from, say, a rough surface and we can tell hot from cold and this kind of thing. We also have glands, all kinds of glands in here. We have sweat glands and we have sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands are going to be particular types of glands that secrete oil out onto the skin and they're typically associated with a hair follicle. We have sweat glands. We have two types that we'll talk about. We have merocrine sweat glands which are what's responsible for typical sudoriferous perspiration or sweat that you can feel. 
But we also have, in certain areas, we have um, apocrine sweat glands, which are typically located in the groin and the armpit area. And this produces a slightly different kind of sweat that instead of being watery, is more oily. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But first, let's continue a little bit more with some features of the epidermis. There's one cell type I forgot to mention in the epidermis, and these are melanocytes. And these have the main cell bodies in the stratum germinativum here, but they have these processes that reach up into the overlying stratum spinosum, and sometimes they can even get as high as the stratum granulosum. But what these cells do is they impart a pigment called melanin. And melanin is very important. That's what gives skin its color. So everybody, interestingly, has the same number of melan melanocytes, typically. But the amount of melanin production is going to vary within individuals. And some of the melanin will basically be secreted into these melanosomes that then will pigment the surrounding cells. And what the purpose of melanin is, is to protect the DNA, because sunlight has ultraviolet light in it. And ultraviolet light can be damaging to DNA. So these melanocytes create this melanin pigment, which is like a sunshade. So it's kind of like your natural sunscreen. And so this is why when you have equatorial regions that have receive more direct sunlight, people in the equatorial regions tend to have darker skin than people who are out on the polar regions where you get very little direct sunlight. And so melanin is extremely important for protecting the, the stratum germinativum here and underlying structures because you do not want to burn the skin and you do not want so much ultraviolet radiation coming in that you can damage the DNA and the stratum germinativum. If you do, you can get some different types of skin cell cancers. So this is why in more recent times as we have sort of eroded away some of our our stratospheric layers that the ozone layer for example that prevents ultraviolet light or basically is kind of a an umbrella around the earth that attenuates the amount of ultraviolet light reaching the earth as we have lost that more and more people are getting more exposed to ultraviolet radiation and so they're getting more skin cancers nowadays. So one of the things you probably notice is if you go out and spend a lot of the time in the sun, your skin gets darker. And this is a result of these melanosomes, these melanocytes producing more melanosomes and giving more pigment. So that if you go out and spend the summer at the beach, well, then you have much darker skin than when you come home and you spend a lot of time indoors in the wintertime. So this is basically our overview of our skin. We also have certain areas, for example, where we have our fingers and our toes, we have these nails, which are also keratinized cells. So the, we have cells that make up this really tight keratin that makes a hard plate. And it's very similar to what we see on some animals that have hard exterior plates. And even hair is basically keratinized cells or keratinized cells that are just full of keratin. Now next what we're going to do is we're going to look at a model of skin and we're going to go over some of these structures in a little bit more detail because you can see them in a little bit more detail on the integument model.